Good morning, Oak Crest, and welcome back to the show. My name is Josh Runkles. Very excited here to bring you a brand new episode of Zoomobile. I'm here with Kathy Hogue, volunteer at the Maryland Zoo in Baltimore, and she does have some great information for us today. Welcome, Kathy. How are you? I'm doing fine, and it's a pleasure to be here. Good, good. Now, I know there's a lot going on right now at the zoo. I do want to get right into that. First, what's this, uh, the breakfast with the animals? Tell me about that. Well, we have a wonderful series of programs called Breakfast with whatever, mm -hmm. chimpanzees, uh, giraffes, penguins, breakfast with, in the African veldt, wow. which is a nice one. Um, you don't actually eat with the animals. The chimpanzees haven't learned table manners yet, <laughs> but you eat in the proximity of the animal. For instance, breakfast with the penguins is right next to our penguin exhibit. Breakfast in the African veldt is on a, a little overlook, and you can see the rhinos and the ostriches and the warthogs. Mm -hmm. By the way, we have five new warthog babies. Wow. Yeah. And uh, the zebras out there in the early morning when they're out and active, because the breakfast start uh, eight in the morning and go till the zoo opens at 10, and then it also includes your zoo entrance fee. Okay. So then you can go and see the animals. Well, I'm glad you clarified that because I envision going and sitting down with a monkey at the table and having breakfast. Well, Might have better manners than some of the people we know. You know. That's true. <laughs> but the penguin would probably not be too good. He'd yeah. insist on fish. and Who wants that for breakfast? And the whole not having that sphincter muscle is probably yeah. a problem at the table. Yeah. You couldn't be sure that that uh, your table wouldn't soon be covered with little piles of guano, as right. they say. Yeah. <laughs> so what else is going on? I, I hear, uh, speaking of penguins, there's a new penguin exhibit, African penguin exhibit coming? Yes, and uh, the Baltimore Sun, I didn't really have a chance because I ran out to read the whole thing, but the Baltimore Sun has front page coverage of our new penguin exhibit. Great. And it's, uh, the groundbreaking has already started, it makes the zoo just a little bit hard to get around right now, but we've, we've just changed the routing on people so that you travel in a different manner than you were traveling before. Okay. And so it's, you know, it's not terribly confusing. There's certainly enough people around to help you. And um, you can see the construction going on. We have a fence, but you can see through the fence and see what is working. So not only can you come to the zoo and see the animals, you can come to the zoo and see workmen. <laughs> yeah, just as exciting. <laughs> just as exciting. Oh, I did see online, actually, you can watch a video, and it tells you all about the planning of this new exhibit. And the, the most interesting thing that I found is you can actually walk through a tunnel, you know, like some of the other exhibits, and look up and see the penguins swim right over top of you. Right, and everything is going to be open. Uh, the major construction material as far as I can tell is plexiglass because you're going to be able to see the keepers feeding the animals. You'll be able to see the nesting boxes, the animals uh, in there trying to raise the babies. Everything is open. You'll see the pe keepers uh, preparing the foods. It's going to be absolutely fascinating. That's great. Now I do know um, what, what I always wonder is, you know, when, when you go and you see something like this, I mean, there's a lot of money involved in a project like that. Where do these funds come from? Well, we do a very uh, consistent work in trying to raise these funds. Our entry to the zoo funds, what you pay to get in that gate, that maintains the animals. Right. And it just barely maintains the animals because we try to keep it as low as possible so that as many people can come, you know, as, as possible. And uh, yet, you know, we don't want to be like some facilities that will remain nameless in the area that are now up to almost $30 right. for an entry fee. So... Um, we have to go out and find these funds, and that's why it takes us so long to do these, these improvements. The city doesn't give us much. They give us some money. I'll, I'll grant them that, but it's, it's a pittance. The state doesn't give us much either, so we're not using public funds for, right. the, for the zoo. But wonderful organizations you know, contribute. I remember that there, there was a golf tournament held uh, over by the sister group, Charleston over there, mm -hmm. uh, golf course over in that area that raised in one day over $17,000. Wow. And it was given to the zoo for, 
for these capital funds. So That's great. Uh, we, we really appreciate donations of any kind. Many of you probably get solicitations from the zoo. Uh, that money is our capital fund money. And when we get enough together to make an improvement, then something like the penguin, uh, new penguin exhibit will be built. But mostly corporate helps us a lot. Under Armour helps us. Uh, Black & Decker helped us with a lot of stuff before they decided to go elsewhere. But Baltimore is not a very strong corporate city. So corporate uh, donations you know, are trickles. We have mm -hmm. to go out and find them. Along those same lines, how, does an an how do you acquire an animal at the zoo? I know there's some brand new animals. You, you were saying there's possums now? Well, we, we just acquired a possum for this program, for the Zoomobile program that will go out, you know, hopefully when he gets a little more hand trained, uh, go out and show him to kids because it's something they could possibly see. And kids have a real love for bunnies and possums and things like that that mm -hmm. they are in their environment that they actually see in their environment. Well, there are a number of ways we get animals for the zoo, but the major way is we trade. Mm -hmm. If we have a lot of, say, um, warthogs we're going to have, we just had five <laughs> babies, we will not keep on exhibit when they grow up five, six, seven warthogs right. because the males don't get along with the females that well, and you know we don't really want a herd of warthogs. Yeah. So those babies will go to other zoos. Now, in exchange, we may trade a warthog, and they will train, uh, trade us an African porcupine. I just wonder about you know being yeah. the person that makes that call. Hey, I've got uh, six warthogs here. I'll give you that for a giraffe. Yeah. You and know, there's actually somebody who does that. That's their profession, correct? Yes, and there is planning. And sometimes the second way we acquire them is we acquire them on loan. For instance, we are lucky enough to have a cheetah that the female, uh, female cheetah that has been declared to be one of the good breeding cheetahs. Okay. So we will, would be allowed to breed her. Unfortunately, the male they sent us, and that was the loan. They loaned us a male from another zoo I see. to mate with this cheetah. She hates him. She <laughs> hates him. She can't stand him. So Just this at may, the place of nice music. Yeah, you know. this may not work out. Uh, but that kind of thing happens. And that is controlled by the people that hold what we call the stud book for these animals. We hold the Baltimore Zoo, the Maryland Zoo at Baltimore, holds the stud book for the African black-footed penguin. Mm -hmm. So it's up to us to say, all right, you have two penguins. We're going to send you a third, and it's time for you to breed them. Wow. You know, uh, the same way somebody else holds the stud book for lions, somebody else holds it for zebras. So zoos across the nation hold different stud books, and they're the ones who say, oh, we got a female, she's breeding age, let's not waste her, send somebody over. And how do we gain possession of one of these stud books? How does that happen? Well, it's done, the American Zoo and Aquarium Organization not the docents, which I belong to, mm -hmm. but the AZA itself. They're the one who certifies zoos. All the zoos belong to them. To be a certified zoo, you have to belong to the AZA. Then they form governing boards. The governing boards make these decisions. All right, so we've covered some of the ways that you acquire animals. Are animals ever just dropped off you know, oh, at the is, front gate of the zoo? Does this is the way we would like not to acquire animals. Right. Some, for some people, zoos mean animals. So if you've got seven kittens because you didn't get your cat fixed, uh, you bring them and you drop them right outside our gate. I'm pretty sure that there are not cats at the zoo. Right? No, we try to keep feral animals out of the zoo. Right. But uh, this is the type of thinking some people have. But even on a bigger scale, we have had calls saying, I bought the cutest little lizard when I was at the uh, Maryland Amphibian and Reptile Show, he was just this little thing. And he's three and a half feet now. <laughs> he's taking over the house. He's, he wants his own room, his own television, his own phone. And we'd like to get rid of them. Uh. <laughs> and we do sometimes take those animals. Uh, if it's a particularly uh, unusual case where we really feel 
compassion for them. We took in a parrot that we had for years, Paco, who died a couple of years ago, but we had Paco for a good 12 years. His owner, only owner, had died, mm -hmm. and the children did not want the parrot. And a parrot that's been with one owner for that length of time is a difficult animal. He's not going to bond really easily. And Paco was a difficult animal. You handled him with a stick because Paco would try to take your finger off. And so uh, we took him out of compassion, and he was a good parrot. I mm -hmm. mean, he became the parrot, the symbol of the zoo for many years. He was a, a blue and yellow, and maybe some of the people out there remember him because he was the spokesman for the zoo for five or six years. Mm. There's one more event I want to cover before we get into the animals that you brought today. Um, I heard a rumor that you're going to be open late one night. Is it right. Not this coming Friday, but Friday the 26th. Okay. Uh, we will be late, uh, open late. We're going to open our normal 10, but we'll be open into the evening hours until 7 o'clock at night rather than closing at 5. Nice. And there'll be some special things out. Uh, people like me will be out with, with some of our embassy animals. Uh, it's it's a nice time because the the animals in the zoo itself, you know, in the afternoon they sleep because right. it's so hot. Yeah. But in the evening, the early evening, they'll come out and be really active just like they will early in the morning. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. This would be the time because it's just been so hot lately that the, the animals probably aren't coming out as much. But you come to this event probably around 6, 7 at night. It gets a little bit cooler. Yeah. You'll start to see some more animals. You'll start out. to see them out because, and it's also that twilight time is when a lot of animals get active. There's no beer at this event, though, right? No beer this at this event. This is not event. the brew. This is, this is just like coming to the zoo, only you get later hours. Gotcha. Okay, why don't we get into some of the animals you brought okay. today? Okay, well, I do have to do a short explanation. Okay. This time of the year, as you said, is so very hot. Transporting and taking the animals out of air-conditioned situations, we have a very strong limitation on what they can uh, tolerate. Now you okay. think, well, there's not a problem. You're going to take him out. You're going to put him in an air-conditioned car. You're going to bring him to an air-conditioned studio and take him home. Well, that's true. And if everything works like it should, that would be perfect. But uh, we have to account for the fact you could have an accident on the way, the car air conditioning can fail, all these things. So the rule is that when it gets to a certain projected temperature, and we're in a week of that right now, mm -hmm. certain animals simply cannot go out. Okay. And most of the mammals and most of the birds are included in that. So that leads me right into segue that it's a reptile day. Oh boy. And all you guys know that I love my reptiles. I think and we know that, that I love my reptiles as well, yes, right? Uh, more than one person Especially the, the slithery ones. <laughs> so I do apologize oh, for boy. having a reptile day here, but that was totally uh, determined by weather. And then we shouldn't have another reptile day. I'm just going to stay over here if that's okay. Okay, that's quite fine. Now this is a milk snake. And a lot of you are going to say, that's not a milk snake. That's a king snake that you used to bring to imitate a coral snake. Mm -hmm. And indeed, he does look like a coral snake, except, as I've expressed before, on the coral snake, the red and the yellow will touch. Mm -hmm. So uh, what you say is, you know, red on yellow, oh, I can't even remember the... the not a friendly fellow. Not a friendly fellow. Let's go or, with that. Yeah. Doesn't look uh, like a friendly red, fellow. Uh, red on black, he's okay, Jack. Stand back. Yeah, no, he's okay, Jack, <laughs> if he has red on black. I got you. But anyway, um, this is not a coral snake, although it imitates one. This is a milk snake. Now, the other one that imitated a coral snake that I brought was a king snake. However, a milk snake is a king snake. A king snake is a milk snake. They all are very closely related. Uh, these got the name milk snakes because they hung around the barns and over the years, everybody said, oh, well, my cow's not giving milk this month. And look, I saw all those snakes in the barn. They must be sucking the cow dry. Really? Yeah. That was the old legend that the snake Just would... a legend, though, right? Oh, yes. I mean, <laughs> do you think he could get his mouth around to suck? I mean, snakes are not real big suckers. Right. They, uh, obviously, they lay eggs or um, they give live birth, but they... 
don't have mammary glands and they certainly do not produce milk to, to suckle the children. Right. So, uh, no. But the reason they would hang around the barn would be rats. Uh, Thousands of rats in your barn, rats and mice. And they, it was a wonderful thing for them because they, they got their food, the farmer got rid of the rats, mm -hmm. which is uh, you know, well worthwhile. I don't know why he's deciding he wants to be all curled up he today. He just wants to hang out there. There the we table. go, a little movement <laughs> here, a little movement. Like to see that. The coloring and of course, is beautiful. Oh, they are. They're gorgeous. Some milk snakes, like the, this, is a western milk snake, but uh, the eastern milk snakes are um, sort of grayish in color, and they have another problem. They can get up to three feet, and they actually get into dry leaves. And first, if you come tromping through the woods, they'll try to run. Mm -hmm. But the second thing they'll do is stand their ground and they'll wiggle their tails in the dry leaves and it sounds like a rattlesnake. Oh. And a lot of poor little milk snakes get killed because somebody hears this you know, and sees a snake and that's it for the snake because, well. Well, they're not even giving them a chance. It doesn't look like a rattlesnake. No, and uh, it doesn't have the head. Remember the uh, triangular head on most of your venomous snakes? Right except the coral snake. Uh, this little guy has a definite round head. Will you definite round head yourself? There we <laughs> go. See how round his head is? So if you know anything about snakes, you won't make the mistake. But like I say, the eastern one is grayish in color like a rattlesnake is. Mm -hmm. And I could understand that people who fear snakes might, might immediately react instead of looking it over. What kind of grip does he have on your hand there? Uh, he can't come off. Right. You know, he will hang on. But not enough but to But not crush. enough to really, me to notice. Right. You know, he, he's, he would uh, wrap around his prey and they don't crush their prey. That, that thought is something that, you know, again, builds up in a legend. What they do is they hold them tightly enough to prevent them from breathing. Mm -hmm. So the prey actually smothers, but they don't break all the bones right. in their body and all that. What breaks the bones in the prey's body is once it goes in his mouth, that peristaltic action of pulling that mouse down into the gut, that's a very strong muscles that do that. And that's mm -hmm. where the, the bones get broken up and everything as it goes down into the gut. And how long does it take that snake to digest, a, say a rat? About a week. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you can see that bulge in the snake the bulge. for a week? Yeah. Or it, continue, it just well, it gets smaller and smaller? it continues to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, they have a wonderful enzyme situation going on in their bellies that we are studying. Uh, medical people study it constantly because if you put something in your belly and it sat there for a week, you'd be a very sick puppy. Mm -hmm. And these guys could do it and it's normal for them. So if we can determine what kind of enzyme is really doing this right. or what kind of system is doing this, we could help people who have that, uh, you know, deathly constipation problem, right. you know, where they impact and can't, you know, literally have to have operations. Right. So it would be good for medical, medical history. So this one is an egg layer, which is oviparous. Snakes are either oviparous, viviparous would be the ones that have live young, and some of them actually hold the eggs in their body and it looks like they're giving birth to live young, but they are actually have a separate area where the egg sits and then it hatches. So they're not giving birth and those are ovoviviparous. And how many eggs eggs. are we talking about at a time? Okay, this guy would be like seven to 14. Wow. Yeah, a lot of eggs. And do seven to 14 survive? Oh, heavens no. Uh, probably one or two will survive. These guys make wonderful meals for birds. They make meals for uh, anything that can catch them, even frogs, mm -hmm. you know, turtles, if they can, can get them. And that's why when you see a baby snake and you might say, oh, well, you wouldn't say, but you might say, oh, so cute. Nah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> it's the baby snakes that are the most aggressive okay. because they, 
somehow nature gives them the knowledge that if they're not aggressive, they're not going to grow up. Right. So there. But the reason these guys can go out is that they are what we call cold-blooded. That means they take the temperature of the area that they're in. Now he's very active because it's a warm day today, and even with the air conditioning, it's not, you know, 40, 50 degrees in here. Right. You know, the air conditioning is barely keeping it down to like 76. So he says, "Woo, nice active time." So these guys can overheat. There is such a, a condition, but you have to get very high temperature and pretty much straight sunlight on them to overheat them. So they just, uh, they warm up in the sun and then they get very active for a little while. They go out and for forage. And then as nighttime comes, they cool down. They get very quiet and sort of curl up. And a as a baby, they're about how, how long? Well, when they're born, they're very tiny. They're inch, inch and a half, but they grow very quickly. Okay. When we got this guy a year ago, he was like from there to there. Mm -hmm. And so he's put on all this additional in about a year and a half. And he'll get bigger, or is that about? Yes, he'll get bigger. He'll get up to three feet. Okay. And as well as we, I'm I mean. I'm glad you're bringing him now. Yeah. <laughs> as well as we feed them, he will probably make three feet. Right. Yeah. Uh, is it a girl or a boy? It's a boy. Mm, I don't know. No. Uh, you have to get a professional. You almost have to do a DNA to determine, unless they're in mating uh, season, in which case you can actually say, oh, yes, well, that's a boy. But right now, you can't, couldn't see anything. You no. know, there's no break, nothing. There's no way to tell. So you've got to be a, a, an expert. Right. But fascinating creatures, absolutely fascinating creatures. And how many of those are at the zoo? That, that Snakes. That particular snake, are there many of them? Inside or out? Inside. No, this is, <laughs> this is probably uh, the only one at the zoo because this is, like I said, it's a western. Right, okay. But milk snakes, probably, well, I, I couldn't really say. Uh, as non-exhibit snakes, there, there could be hundreds. But we're not breeding this milk no, snake. No, 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 no. It would be tough if there's yeah, only one of them. If there's only one of them, yeah. We, like I say, we do not breed any of our animals unless we are told to. So, uh, unless somebody looks at their breeding book and says, "Hey, we need to yeah, call the Maryland Zoo right, and because breed this animal." Who wants to take care of small animals? Right. It's a difficult. It, it's time consuming. A lot of a lot of things are going on taking care of small animals. Mm -hmm. I know. I just acquired two kittens. <laughs> Haven't slept since. Uh, this is Picasso, and Picasso has been here before. Yeah, we've seen Picasso. Yeah. Now, Picasso is a beautiful example for one of the other characteristics of reptiles. We've covered cold-blooded. Mm -hmm. All right. There are, Picasso shows the fact that all reptiles have scales. And in Picasso, those scales have become these... Uh, Scoots, they call them, S-C-U-T-E-S, -E uh, on his shell. Now, when he was born, when he was just a little turtle, those things weren't much bigger than my, than my thumbnail. Mm -hmm. But as he grows, the scoots grow. So as he gets bigger, and he's about as big as he's going to get, uh, those scoots will increase. Now, on some, you'll see it on the tortoise, when I bring out the tortoise, there are actually seem to be growth lines on the scoots. But this guy is perfectly smooth. So it's not a way to make uh, the animal determine his, his age. So that is a rumor. That is a rumor, the scoot, yeah. The number of scoots does not mean anything? It doesn't mean anything. It's just how many it takes to in this species to make a shell. Okay. He's got one, two, three, four, five that go down, and everybody in his species will have that number. It's a species characteristic. Now, this guy will not bite you? No. Okay. I, I think it's important while you have the, the turtle out here to mention that there are, <laughs> I've seen a lot of pictures recently, there. people taking you know pictures on the, their biking trails or running trails, and the, you see some turtles with the, with the tail that's kind of um, pointy. Yeah. That Those is a are, snapping turtle. That's a snapping turtle. <laughs> and they will yeah. hurt you. And they will hurt you, and they can stick their necks out a long way. So don't think that you can pick a snapping turtle up like this. 
right. and be free because he'll he can twist around and get you. Exactly. And if I you're think, going to pick a snapping turtle up, he has to be back here. I think but as just snakes, don't. you know, have kind of gotten that bad reputation. Yeah. Turtles, I think, have a reputation of being very friendly, and it's good to clear the air there because they're not all friendly. No, and this is a pond turtle, so this is uh, one similar to a terrapin that we we find in water. Mm -hmm. These are fascinating in that they will actually, um, don't go back in, oh. anyway, <laughs> the side of his head, if, if you can see that, has lines on it. It's probably more obvious on this side. Yeah, yeah keep it right there, that's perfect. Yeah, um, this is why it's called a painted turtle. And painted turtles are the most common turtle in the United States. They uh, you find them all up and down the East Coast. You find them everywhere but down in that Southwest desert area. But when you get over into Washington, Oregon, California, they're very rare. Mm -hmm. They're there, but they're, they're not in the numbers that you find them in Michigan, Minnesota, you know, Pennsylvania. There are lots and lots of them there. You'll see these guys, first thing they do in the morning, you know, get up, have a cup of coffee. But after that, they go out and they sit on a board or something and in the sunshine to bring the body temperature up. Mm -hmm. Once they get that body temperature up, then they go foraging for food. Food is algae, crustaceans, dead fish on the bottom of the pond, anything they can catch, insects. They eat a lot of insects. So that's almost like a solar powered shell. I mean, they're absorbing the heat within the shell. Well, they yeah, they absorb it and uh, then they'll get cold because they're in the water. You're right. looking for the algae, you're in the water, you're going to get cold. So up they come again and they sit until they warm up and then they go back looking for food. Tough day. Tough day. So <laughs> in the afternoons in particular, you'll go around, you'll see them, any pond, you probably will see one of these guys or many of these guys sitting out. Uh, there are a lot of them in some ponds. There have been, uh, they have been recorded walking from pond to pond in numbers up to, at one point, somebody recorded a hundred of them going in a mass group to another pond. So, very interesting. Wow. Probably the first turtle you ever had if you had a turtle. Yeah, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about that. I think at some point during everybody's life, they pick one of these things up and say, hey, it's a great idea to put this in a cardboard box and keep it as a pet. Do we recommend that? No. Number one, you don't know how to handle them. Uh, these guys don't eat in the winter much. Mm -hmm. In the winter, they go into hibernation. They dig down uh, like a seven foot deep pond. They will actually go into the mud at the bottom, dig down another couple of feet, and they'll stay there all winter. Mm -hmm. They are able uh, not to breathe. They have a methodology where they can exchange a little bit of oxygen from the water through their skin, but as a whole, they can just shut it down and not get oxygen. Wow. And the buildup of the lactic acid that would kill us if we don't have oxygen, uh, they have a methodology of taking care of that somehow. And again, they need to be studied a whole lot more to find out exactly how they get rid of that lactic acid. That's fascinating, I didn't know that. Turtles are some of the most fascinating creatures alive, I, I really think. Oh, and you can't take him out of his shell either. Right. But when they don't, cartoons have <laughs> yeah. kind of built that myth as well. When you when they don't eat, you have to uh, you don't have to force feed them or anything, and that's another mistake people make that kills them. Mm -hmm. They try to force hamburger down them. Well, an adult turtle is not a big carnivore. Adult turtle is pretty much a herbivore, so you're not going to. Crickets are good though. But they'll eat it if they'll you put it. it in front of them, mm -hmm. and that's what gets them into trouble. Yeah. Crickets are good though, they like insects there. Right. Okay, this is the big guy, and I'm going to just put All this right. out it's because milk. we don't want to mess up the furniture. If you'll take that in. Yeah. Oh, there we go. That out there, yeah. Um, Always thinking about our furniture. Well, <laughs> after that embarrassing time I had when I bought a, brought a goat. <laughs> hate when that happens. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to have to stand up. He is right. heavy. Well, 
little bit of a struggle here to get this one. Yeah, <laughs> it's just because he's so heavy. Oh, there you go. You want to hold him and see how heavy he wow, is? Wow, sure. Can I hold him underneath the shell yeah, here? Just like that. Oh, he didn't. Just, he won't go to the bathroom. No, right? I hope okay. not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See how heavy he is? He's yeah. very heavy. Yes. Yeah, so Put on him on. right here. He's 20, oh, 20 some pounds. Wow. And uh, this is a um, red-footed tortoise. And you can see the red on the feet. This is a South African tor or South American tortoise. He's savanna and forest. So he's that part of the Amazon where the forest comes down into the grasslands. And he forages. Definitely a vegetarian. Doesn't eat anything that's not a vegetable. And he, this guy, we acquired in 1986. Oh, okay. And he wasn't a young turtle then. So we have no idea what his age is, but we know at least, you know, 20, 26 years here, 27 years. And he can live to be how old? Could be, we think he could live to be 50. Okay. Or even perhaps longer. Now, you see the marks on the scoots here? Mm-hmm. These guys, that's where the information came that you could count those and find out how old he is. Right. Doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> but those growth rings, just like a tree kind of, are um, signs that he had good years and bad years. Here's a real wide one from mm -hmm. there to there. It's about a quarter of an inch wide. These are wow. very, very narrow. So okay. this must have been a really, really good year. Yeah. So he's going to put on more growth on years when he uh, has a lot of food, less when he doesn't. Now, what's really interesting, this, this one digs holes to lay eggs. Um, it's about, whereas Picasso, it's a month for those eggs to hatch. When he digs this guy, it takes uh, about two months to hatch the eggs. Bigger animal. And another characteristic of reptiles they can determine the sex of their offspring by temperature. So if the temperature is really, is higher, you will get more males. If it's lower, you will get more females. Oh, I thought that would have been reversed. No, <laughs> well, hot-blooded <laughs> females, yeah. So now, obviously, this is a big animal, so mm -hmm. he's going to make a big meal. And this is the main predator for this animal is humans. Really? Turtle soup. Turtle soup, turtle, fried turtle, all sorts of things with it. Now, a very interesting thing is, of course, you know that South America is a basic, very Catholic area, and it's old uh, world Catholic in a lot of senses. In the United States, sometimes those of us who are Catholic, like my husband, uh, has given up not eating meat on Fridays. He eats anything, anytime. But it <laughs> used to be that you had to eat fish on Friday, fish right. or vegetables. Well, in these old world Catholic countries like South America, that is still maintained. They still eat fish on Friday. However, the Pope said you can eat fish and turtles. Hmm. So this has become a staple for Friday meals. And so humans take uh, a lot of these turtles for food. He was not excited about that news. He's on the run now. He's on the run now, <laughs> yeah. You look very hungry, that's yeah. why. <laughs> Something interesting I've noticed about this particular turtle is the, the curvature of the shell. Most turtles you see, it, it's a different shape. This really curves into the body, almost making the turtle look slender. Yeah, is he there a reason for that? He almost looks like an hourglass. Mm -hmm. No, that's just... Uh, that's just the characteristic of the breed. However, yeah. let's look at this. This is a male. Yeah. And why do we have this big hole in the plastron down here? It's because when you crawl up on a female turtle, you got to be able to fit. Oh. So during mating season, this turtle will be halfway up on the female, and that little hole allows him to just fit in nicely. And of course, turtles are born with hard eggs. Well, not hard eggs, but uh, eggs. So you have to have internal fertilization. Oh, okay. You know, you can you can get away with with non-internal external fertilization on fish and frogs, because 
the female just drops the eggs and the male comes by and sprays the sperm around. But anytime you have an egg that isn't open, you know, that has a shell of some kind, whether it be leathery like these guys are hard like a chicken, uh, you've got to get the internal fertilization prior to laying the egg. I feel like turtles mate a lot more than other animals. It seems like every time I go to the zoo, they're, <laughs> they're mating in the cage. On top of that, uh, that's not always a female and a male. <laughs> yeah, it seems to be a natural instinct. So, you know, you come across a turtle, let's not take time to figure out who yeah. it is, let's just give it a little. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but if it's actually courting a female, uh, they will they will go ne uh, nose to nose, and then they do a kind of little head dance where they look it over. But I I have never heard legends about turtles actually turning and down a male. You right. know? I'm not sure how you would do that. You know, run. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the fastest, the right. female or the male? Now, in these guys, uh, the male is actually bigger. In some turtles, the female is bigger because she you know, has to start the eggs and everything. But this turtle, for some reason, the male remains larger than the female. So, but fascinating, again, all reptiles are fascinating, but these guys in particular are, are uh, turtles are, are just so interesting. Never goes in water, gets all its water from the vegetables or fruits that it eats or the grass. So uh, we don't put out water for him in his cage at all. We put out a lot of food, but not water. See, I like the turtle because you actually have a chance to look at it and really examine the turtle before it can get away from you. Right. Great yeah. animal. And it's, you know, reasonably cooperative. You can actually pick a turtle up, you know, and he d isn't biting you. For instance, this red-footed turtle, I think it's fascinating, the designs on the bottom of his feet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, that's the reason he's called a red-footed turtle. Mm -hmm. Now, he's quiescent. His tail, however, is all tucked in, meaning he's a little bit frightened. Mm -hmm. I heard a vet say when people would bring him turtles and they'd all be inside their shell, that the only way he could ever get their heads out was to stick a probe up the tail. <laughs> that, <laughs> the that'll do it. Out. Works every time. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the, this is, of course, their protection. And what are they protected against? in the savanna and the, the forest area of the Amazon, it's their major predator as an adult is jaguars. Hmm. Yeah. As a little turtle, they can be eaten by a lot of things. But, but a jaguar, say a jaguar is coming towards this turtle, it can just it invert can withdraw everything. and it can't be hurt at that point? Yes, because this, even this, feel this, it's yeah. not, a jaguar's teeth are not going to be powerful enough to go through that. Yeah. I don't know about a jaguar's grasp, but I can imagine that yeah. <laughs> this shell is pretty hard. With the mouth wide open. And, and uh, we haven't had any reports of jaguars picking up rocks and <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> in turtles yet. So uh, he's pretty, as an adult, he has basically no predators except humans. Okay. So. Well, we are running out of time here, but before we go, I, I do want to remind our watchers here, what were some of those events we talked about in the beginning of the show? We have the evening at the zoo. Evening at the zoo, the uh, breakfast with the various animals or groups of animals, okay. which is very nice. Breakfast with the giraffe. I did see on the website some of the animals are sold out, but the giraffe, I think, is still available. There's a monkey, I yeah, think. Yeah, chimpanzees. Chimpanzee. Breakfast okay. chimpanzees. Best bet, go to our website, www. Uh, MarylandZoo.org. Remember, we're not a com, we're an org because we're a nonprofit organization. Right. But uh, that will give you entry weight. But if you just Google Maryland Zoo, you will get, you know, the website. You don't have to remember it exactly like you used to in years gone by. So you can find us very easily. We even answer to the Baltimore Zoo. Mm -hmm. You know, you can get us that way. And remind people, please do not drop your kittens off at the yes, gate. Please don't drop your kittens <laughs> off at the gate. Please do not even drop your exotic reptiles off at the gate. Right. That is not the place. <laughs> it is not the place. Uh, there is the Mid-Atlantic Reptile Association. It's a wonderful organization that does take in reptiles that are no longer wanted. And we usually, if we get one dropped off, we'll give it to them. 
All right. Well, thank you so much for coming out again. We appreciate it, as always. And that does wrap up another episode of Zoomobile, folks. If you did miss the show, you can tune in again at 2, 7, 9, or midnight. Once again, my name is Josh Runkles. Have a great day.